Thanks, Tara. And hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Karen Fellows, and I am the uh, vice chair of iWork this year. I'm a uh, restructuring lawyer in Canada with Steichen Elliott based in Calgary and Vancouver. And it is my distinct pleasure today to, uh, I have the honor of presenting the Women of the Year in Restructuring Award, which we colloquially call the Warrior Award. And I can say that this year's recipient is a very suitable uh, person uh, for that description because she is in all sense uh, a warrior for our profession and someone we all look up to. I'm very proud because uh, to call her uh, a fellow Canadian and I've known DJ Miller for many years now. Uh, so the uh, recipient of the award this year is DJ Miller. She is a partner with Thornton Brown Finnegan in Toronto. Uh, the description of the award itself, I looked at the nomination form, um, and it describes someone who's had recent contributions to the insolvency and restructuring industry anywhere in the world. The achievements do not have to be uh, nationally renowned cases or result in landmark decisions, but they have to be exceptional, and the person has to be exceptional. And I can say that DJ is one of those exceptional people. She's had an exceptional career, and she's also been involved recently in a landmark case in Canada. Uh, we had applications from all over the world, and DJ was uh, the chosen winner because of both her career experience and her recent contributions. And I'll tell you a little bit about one of the recent cases she was involved with in Canada. So DJ, just a brief introduction, uh, started her career in the 90s in Toronto, just like me, but unlike me, who eventually migrated west, she spent most of her career at the same firm. She was the first female partner at Thornton Brout Finnegan, which is one of Canada's premier insolvency boutiques, if not the premier insolvency boutique. And uh, uh, this firm is also uh, exceptional because it now has more female partners and then male partners. And I think that's the only restructuring firm in Canada that has that designation. Um, and DJ, of course, has been a leader in that firm and also in the insolvency profession in Toronto. And there's many women who look up to her as their mentor, including her nominator, Rebecca Kennedy, who's here with us today. Uh, DJ acts for lenders, monitors, receivers, uh, debtors, uh, basically the whole panoply of players in restructuring in Canada. She effectively manages her team. Her nominator described her as strategic and thoughtful and said she uses the tagline, we set precedents rather than follow trends. And I think that's an example of her type of innovative and creative thinking. She's known uh, for her cross-border work as well. She was involved in the Nortel restructuring and some recent um, international cases and does have a good percentage of her practice doing international work. In Canada, particularly, I told you there was a noteworthy case that DJ was involved with. She acted for the debtor of, in the case of Laurentian University. Laurentian University filed for CCAA protection in February of 2021, and CCAA is the rough equivalent of Chapter 11. And it was a notable case because it was the first time in Canadian history that a publicly funded university had filed for um, restructuring under a restructuring statute. And as a result of DJ's and other stakeholders' efforts, uh, there was a, a successful restructuring and the university exited from CCAA protection um, in November of last year. Not only does DJ handle big cases, she gives back to the industry. Uh, she is past president of the TMA Toronto's branch and has been recognized recently as a titan of the industry by TMA. Uh, she's been TMA woman of, she's had the TMA woman of excellence award, insolvency litigator of the year by Benchmark Canada in 2016, 2018 and 2020. She's consistently named amongst the top 50 women litigators in Canada, has won the Lexburg Zenith Award. She's a member of the III, the International Insolvency Institute, the IIC, the Insolvency Institute of Canada, and um, is, of course, a longtime member of iWork and a supporter of iWork. In addition to all this work, she teaches. She teaches an advanced insolvency law course at the University of Windsor Law School and has been a guest lecturer at Western University, Queen's University, and the University of Ottawa. 
So and to sum up DJ's contributions, uh, her nominator describes her as a fearless advocate, but also importantly, a warm and friendly person. She is a trusted confidant and someone who will listen and empathize and help you develop an action plan. So I think uh, DJ uh, really embodies the spirit of our Warrior Award and I'm very pleased to welcome her up on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, that was very kind. And thank you, iWork, for this award. Um, I can't tell you how meaningful it is to receive an award uh, from an organization that is focused uh, on supporting and encouraging women in our profession. It's uh, very, very meaningful. So thank you so much. Um, also, thank you to Rebecca, who nominated me for this award and uh, is one of my women partners uh, at TGF, together with Leanne, who's also here. Um, and they are exceptional women who I am so proud to call partners and friends. Um, and so thank you for all your support over the years. Heather, I know you will be coming up shortly. Congratulations on your Hall of Fame award and uh, your career as we read about it is an inspiration to all of us. So congratulations on that as well. It occurred to me when I was preparing to come down here that iWork was founded in 1993 as we heard from the uh, YouTube presentation earlier. That also happens to be the year that I was called to the bar in Canada. So really it's a 30th uh, anniversary for both of us, for iWork and, and for myself. When I look at what has uh, happened over the past 30 years, it's truly exceptional, um, you know, to look at our practice, to look at our uh, our career, where where it has progressed in that time. And I've I've heard people through the day, including with uh, you know the founders of iWork, talking about what it looked like in '93. I remember that well. Uh, we heard Laura on the um, on the marketing panel uh, referring to some of that. It's hard to imagine as we sort of sit here and try and reflect back what, what it was like 30 years ago, uh, but to see a room full of women, exceptional, extraordinary women uh, like this, uh, you know, in our industry leading and succeeding, uh, it's just, it's very special. So <clears throat> one of the other things that was mentioned this morning is the concept of, you know, dropping the pebble in the water and seeing where the ripples go. We heard this morning the, the idea of three women sitting around a room thinking, wouldn't it be great to have an organization where we could connect uh, women internationally? Look what that has done over the course of three years. That should be an inspiration to all of us as we're doing whatever we're doing during the course of our days. I've spoken to people, you know, not just last night and, and today at, at this conference, but in other conferences, but how many of us can relate to the fact of going to an industry conference or an organization or a work event or a client event where you, you walk in and you gravitate towards and you find the women in the room. You work your way across the room by meeting other women in the room. It is a tremendous sense of connection that we all share. Um, and that is really a space that I work has developed for all of us. It's created the opportunities to make, expand, and maintain those connections so that we have those familiar faces that you, you, know, you can sort of latch onto as you're in a room and a sea full of people that you probably don't know 90% of. You find the familiar faces, you connect with them, and that is just a, you know, that is a, an asset that we have through the organization and the, um, and the work of iWork and many people who've been involved in it for 30 years but we're not finished <laughs> and we're not there yet. And I think, you know, that is also a common theme that you'll hear uh, from people who can reflect on where we've come in 30 years, but also where we are right now. And there's a lot more to do. And I would say that each of us, all of us involved in, in this insolvency practice that we obviously all love, have a role to play in ensuring that women continue to be attracted and stay in the insolvency field. It doesn't happen by chance, and it doesn't just happen with the passage of time. It actually takes active efforts on the part of all of us to help ensure that that occurs. 
I work shines a spotlight on women in insolvency because although we have made great strides over 30 years, there's still a lot of work to be done. And where I see that in particular is in keeping women at the more senior levels and certainly women in the financial advisor uh, roles because we have more women who are entering uh, the profession in all of those areas, but we also have a lot of women who leave at various times. Um, and it is still continually difficult to attract and retain women on the financial advisor side. But that I'm not discouraged by where we're at and actually encouraged because I know what it looked like uh, in 1993. I know what it looks like now. And I think there's just so much momentum, um, true momentum, especially when you get together with groups of women like this at, a, at, a, at an event. The one thing that has been an almost constant theme and, and keeps coming back to me and I'm sure to others uh, as we look at where the profession's at and where we hope that it will be in future is this idea of mentorship. And I truly consider it a privilege to be a mentor to other people. I, I believe in its importance. I think it's particularly important for women in our industry. And I think that importance can't be overstated. The fact of having someone in your corner who wants you to succeed, has your back, and is willing to invest the time to show you how to develop a practice, how to maintain lasting client relationships, and be a leader is monumental. But it takes a lot of time. And since time is the one thing that all of us wish that we had more of, and we never seem to have enough of, it can be a big sacrifice. Time spent being an active mentor means time taken away from client work, time taken away from our families. There's only 24 hours in a day, and we all have to fit everything that we have to do in within that 24 hours. But the effects of the global pandemic over the past three years and the move away from five days a week in person in the office has had a tremendous, and I would say negative impact on the, um, the effects of mentorship. And it's created a gap in our industry over that period of time. My partner, Leanne Williams, who's here, and a Canadian colleague, John McKenna from PwC, did a pretty extensive study in Canada recently um, so while the study is based on Canadian stats and a lot of interviews with Canadian practitioners, I think the, um, the results of it may resonate with a lot of you from different jurisdictions. The study that they undertook was on the effects of COVID on the insolvency and restructuring practice in Canada. Now, some of those changes were actually positive. We had a very, very backwards, paper-based, non-electronic, court system, we were still serving, you know, bound motion records. We didn't have electronic court hearings and we moved monumentally almost overnight uh, to paperless and uh, virtual hearings. But there were huge negative impacts during that period as well. And the one of them that really came out most strongly through that study that they did was the disproportionately greater negative impact on younger members of the insolvency practice. And a consistent theme as to why that is and how that occurred was the during the lockdown and the impact of working virtually, working remotely, most senior practitioners who participated in this study were quite happy to work remotely. They were quite happy to continue doing what they had been doing. But for the most part, the more senior members of the profession, first of all, you know, stereotypically lived in larger homes, had second homes or vacation places that they could work remotely from. More junior members of the profession often had much smaller places that weren't really set up for working from home. More senior practitioners uh, had established professional reputations. They had established networks of clients and colleagues. They had an established and well-recognized knowledge of the insolvency practice things that more junior members of the profession didn't have. So in short, the upshot of that study that they did, which I would commend you to reading, is that maintaining a senior level practice remotely, virtually, is much easier than establishing 
or building your career remotely. And so let's not forget that when we're looking at, um, you know, retaining, attracting, maintaining women in particular in the practice. The biggest cause of that lack of professional development that became apparent in that study was the lack of mentoring that was available to the younger members of our profession during the COVID pandemic. And at the beginning of the pandemic, it seems like a long, long time ago, but if you think about in March of 2020, we were all just focused on how you survive in this new world, how you get client work done, how you function with all these new platforms that we had to learn. The focus wasn't on how can I make sure that, you know, that this first, second, third year uh, person in my firm is really getting the degree of mentorship. That took a bit of time and it took time over the course of the pandemic for us to shift our focus to those sorts of issues. And it's hard to replicate in a virtual setting. We all know from all of the years in which we've practiced not remotely, how important those informal, impromptu um, opportunities for mentorship arise in an office setting, in a real live setting. It takes planning and discipline and a lot of skills to try and do that in a remote setting. And it's really not uh, capable of being replicated. The upshot of all of this and, and why I'm pointing this out is that uh, I believe, and I think it's, it's borne out by the study that was done, that the pandemic has created a gap that we all now have to find a way to backfill. And we have to be really making concerted efforts to try and bridge that lack of mentoring that's occurred over the last few years. So I always, also try to look from th look at things from a bit of a broader perspective. And I'm, I'm doing that in the context of this organization and, and the award that I'm also so grateful to receive. iWork has played such an important role, I would say for all of us in terms of what, uh, what we have gained from it over the course of the 30 years or however long you've been involved um, in iWork. It's really helped to bridge and close that gap, the gender gap that it sought to, um, to address. And so while I would say that in the 30 years that I've practiced and looking over that period of time, the, you know, certainly there have been great strides made in the profession, but there's always more that can be done. But we also, while we're looking at that, can't lose sight of the fact that everyone in this room basically forms part of the 1% globally. And I'm just going to pause there for a second and have you think about that, because the challenges that we face, you know, as working professionals in what we do really are not greater than the barriers. I'm sorry, I'm so passionate about this. Um, they're not greater than the barriers that exist for women generally, um, it, either in other parts of the world or, quite frankly, outside of our profession, barriers that women face in our own communities. So I think it was, um, I, don't, I don't know if it was Laura or one of the women earlier that were saying, you know, we all have an opportunity. We have this tremendous platform. We have the skills, we have the networks, we have the education to really make a difference. And so I would encourage all of us to think about that, think about the privileges that we share um, and use that in, in whatever way you can. I also want to have you sort of look around this room because honestly, in the 24 hours that I've been here and interacting with all of you, it's, it's constantly reminded me that this organization, the members of the organization and the women that comprise this organization are exceptional. I mean, it is, it is a room of exceptional women. And so I know that when it's, you know, award time and awards are, are given to individuals and I'm, I am so grateful for it and I am grateful to receive it. Um, I really do feel like I'm accepting it on behalf of so many of you. And, um, and I want to share it with you because uh, I feel like my career has benefited from the interactions with you. So thank you. All right, time for the formal award presentation so you can get a photo of the fun. Oh. <laughs> now it's a photo, photo opportunity. You want it? Yeah. Right there? Okay. Right there? Okay. Oh, of course. Okay. Make sure we get the photo. Okay. 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 Okay
Congratulations, DJ. Few announcements before I start with the next award. First, some thank yous for today. Um, a thank you to Hogan Lovell and Kevin Carey for hosting us today. Um, space is great. Um, and a big thank you to all our speakers. Great job, the panels were awesome. Um, and to our programming chairs, uh, co-chairs, Chrissy Sanfilippo and Jen McConnell. Thank you, ladies. Um, <laughs> And Kim, sorry, and Kim, I'm sorry. I thought it was Jen. I'm sorry. Sorry, Kim. Where are you? I apologize. Sorry. Um, and as always, a big thank you to Shari, Cece, Jenny, and Heather for making our conference always run so smoothly. So thank you, ladies. Our new networks committee would like um, all of you to be ambassadors for our global expansion of iWork. Please use your personal networks um, to identify potential leaders where there are new networks. And if you have any potential um, leaders slash networks, please reach out to Niana Miller and or Margo McInnes. Um, and if you don't have their contact info, they're both on the iWork website. It's, it's a great tool to look people up. I use it all the time. Um, next, if you are doing an intermezzo after lunch, um, if you're going on the he doing the headshot intermezzo, you will be in room 301 here on this floor. Um, if you're going to the African American Museum tour, you will meet outside the lunchroom at 155. Please wear, be wearing your walking shoes. This is no time to go back to the hotel. Um, and if you're doing the ghost tour slash scavenger hunt, please meet in the lobby, um, you know, the, the entrance of the um, 14th Street at the JW Marriott. And lastly, anyone who has a 20 plus year ribbon for iWork, we'd like to get a picture um, at the front of the room after um, the award ceremony, but before lunch. And if you have been a member for more than 20 years and you don't have a ribbon, you're also welcome to join. So in, 19, in 2022, iWork began honoring a woman for her career contributions to the insolvency and restructuring industry with the Women, Women of the Restructuring Hall of Fame Award. She may be a judge, an attorney, a banker, a turnaround professional, an academic or other restructuring industry professional. She'll be actively engaged or recently retired from the restructuring industry and from anywhere in the world. This year's honor goes to Heather Swanston of PwC in Japan. Heather has been a partner at PwC for over 20 years and with the firm for a total of 35 years. She's worked across five continents, pretty impressive, um, and at different times in her career has lived in the UK, South Korea, and Japan. For the last three and a half years, which obviously included the global pandemic, Heather has lived it has served as the global restructuring services leader for PwC based in Tokyo and leading a restructuring team of over 2,000 professionals in 70 countries. During this period, Heather was also a member of the PwC Japan Executive Board responsible for the global liaison and change. In early 2020, she led the team with the rapid launch of an Act to Recover campaign this campaign drew together the spectrum of the restructuring and insolvency capabilities globally to provide help to distressed clients, including, including uh, in severely affected industries of the pandemic, such as tourism, travel, and automotive. Heather has also co-authored the strategy and business article, How to Succeed in Uncertain Times. Heather has been instrumental in putting forward new ideas to the restructuring profession in Japan, she has spoken to spoken at or written materials 
for restructuring uh, industry restructuring events and has and as a result has been involved in Japanese restructuring cases um, and has been able to highlight weaknesses in the system of other territories such as UK or USA assisting a number of her fellow Japanese restructuring partners to get involved in senior level discussions to lobby government for changes to the rules and regulations in Japan. I mentioned before that Heather spent some time in Korea. While she was in Korea um, during the Asian financial crisis, Heather worked in the restructuring team of the Korean Exchange Bank for nine months, leading the development of the workout techniques for teams looking after chair table exposures such as Hyundai and Daewoo. She was also the lead PwC person in a consortium of advisors assisting the government with the setup of Korea Aerospace Industries, Inc., one of the Korean big deals designed by the Korean government's restructuring unit to take internal competition out of the market. This involved merging the aerospace and defense assets and the debt of Daewoo, Samsung, and Hyundai. Prior to this, while in London for six years, she was she was PwC restructuring and um, refinancing and restructuring leader and a member of the UK's restructuring and insolvency executive team, leading 50 part, over 50 partners and 750 professionals. From 2015 to 2018, Heather was an elected member of the PwC UK Advisory Board. It's the, for, the governance body of the UK firm, during which time she chaired the subcommittee responsible for, for people. And in her day-to-day -day restructuring advisory um, as, a re, as a partner, Heather had led numerous multi-stakeholder and cross-border financial advisory mandates. Heather's projects cover a variety of industries, including construction, property and house building, business services, power, including gas, waste management, mining, automotive, retail, and hospitality, leisure, travel, and FMCG sectors. For anyone who has met Heather knows she is determined, forthright, resilient, and listens to people. In her own words, actually her nominee um, put this in the, in the nomination, in her own words from a newspaper article or interview back in 2009, Heather said that her most valuable skill is being able to listen. My job is like being a detective inspector. It is an investigation. And the, and the question me and my team are trying to answer is, why has it gone wrong and how can it be put right? That's the excitement and the buzz. What makes me proud through innovate, innovative ways, you can get people to cross the line with you when you take them where they initially don't want to go. Heather has always been passionate about staff development and inclusion. She was PwC's, PwC UK's first female partner, the um, restructuring partner, working in a team of more than 50 male partners for eight years before finally bringing another female partner through. She championed many women in the business, sponsoring and mentoring them through the hierarchy. The team is now much more diverse with many women and more ethnicity than the situation she inherited. In the early 2000s, Heather was one of the one of the very few female restructuring professionals in the market. Since then, she has continued not only to build her own career and experience, but to mentor and support the careers of those around her, both men and women. She has led the development of networks that have benefited many, including the young restructuring professionals dinners in London more than 20 years ago. Anyone who has met Heather knows that she is not one to shy away from speaking up and speaking out for the right thing and to wholeheartedly throw herself in whatever she does. Her achievements during her career, the leadership roles that she has assumed, and the passion that she has shown for her profession and those she has worked with speak for themselves. Please join me in congratulating Heather Swanston as she receives the 2023 IWORK Hall of Fame Award. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I feel that I'm in very esteemed, fantastic company, DJ. Um, you, you also have had an amazing career. So uh, congratulations to you too. 
So uh, this comes at such an amazing time for me, actually, because although I've been in the industry for um, many, many years, as you've already heard, I'm about to um, leap off the cliff of leaving a big organisation like PricewaterhouseCoopers and in exactly eight days time, I will no longer be a partner. Um, but I promised myself that um, when I turned 55, I would do 10 years of something else. And that's that's what I intend to do. Um, so this has come at an amazing time. Thank you to iWork and actually also thank you to the PwC ladies that um, surprised me with their nomination. Um, I, I think it's it. It, it for them was great to have somebody who they've seen in their business for um, a long time and um and whether i like it or not i think they have lots of them have seen me as a role model um and um, and that, and that's great for the whole team i could never have imagined in 1995 when i got involved in my first restructuring case uh, which was actually the money printer of the uk so de, de la rue um, that I would be here 28 years later, um, having spent a uh, huge career in, um, in restructuring. I've honest, honestly loved it all. Um, of course, there are always highs and lows, um, but I have honestly loved it all. Uh, my specialism is, as you've heard, in cross-border um, financial advisory work. And um, it's been it's been Fascinating, actually, listening to everybody talking today and, and how I work has become the size that it is with over 2000 professionals um, in many countries, I think 62 countries. And that's actually not a similar size, as you've heard from the PwC team. Um, so I think it's great that um, I work has got to where it's got to. And it's it's an incredible organization. Um, you heard that I lived in Seoul during the Asian financial crisis and also that um, I've been in Japan for um, more than the last three and a half years. In fact, I've only been back in the UK for a couple of months. Um, and I honestly have to say that during being in Japan um, as a white female during lockdown and the pandemic, when Japan didn't open its borders until October 2022, was actually really challenging from a personal perspective. But the iWork community in Asia Pac, which I probably hadn't really benefited from when I was in the UK, because there are lots of women in the London market already without kind of the iWork organization that there was then, although I know that it's, it, it's become huge now. Um, iWork gave me something in Asia Pack that I hadn't had um, previously, which was a network of individuals who wanted to look after me and embrace me. And the Zoom calls that we had with all sorts of people from Singapore to Hong Kong, to Tokyo, to Taiwan, it was great. And it didn't need to be masses and masses of people, but just to have kind of 10 people on call with you every month was really, really great. So I have personally benefited from the iWork network, um, as well as hopefully being able to give back um, in, in my career to many women in, in the industry. Um, I've always been someone who was very, very prepared to break the mold, finding innovative solutions to deals, um, and really bringing the forefront of technical and commercial skills to bear. Um, I, have, I, have provi I have provided the environment for teams that I have worked with and led to um, come up with some crazy solutions and things that have been done for the first time in the market. So when I was at Royal Bank of Scotland, RBS had just bought NatWest. It had the biggest exposures in the UK market on most private equity buyouts. And in 2000, I was involved in the very, very first pre-PAC insolvency administration away from a private equity fund, um, which had never been done in the UK market before and caused a, a real stir. But obviously now it's happened many, on many, many, many occasions. Um, it, shortly after that, I was involved in the restructuring of the largest um, electricity generator in the UK. It was about 12%. And the government were very, very concerned that if the whole business went down, the lights would go out in the UK, which wouldn't have been great by anyone's stretch of imagination. Um, and we actually used the UK court took jurisdiction um, over many countries through a UK scheme of arrangement. And that was one of the first times that multiple jurisdictions have been, been pulled in to um, a UK process. And we've heard quite a lot today, actually. I was fascinated by the conversation that was happening at the front this morning about Chapter 15 and how 
the US also um, has a process of um, trying to make sure that there is common proceedings um, over an insolvency. But that was one of the first times that it had happened in the UK, and it was a US-owned business, actually, which, which was, was quite interesting. And my third one is actually a much more recent case, Morelli, um, which was a very significant tier one supplier to the automotive industry that has literally just at the back end of 2022 completed a civil rehabilitation um, process in Japan. And it's the first time um, that that process has been used in Japan. And again, many, many international stakeholders involved in that business. Um, so, yes, I've, I've, I've been a groundbreaker, but I could not have done that without the teams of people that have worked with me and not just from my own organisation. On all of the restructuring cases that I'm involved with, there are so many people involved from the legal profession, from the accounting profession, from the financial advisory profession. And those teams together and the diversity of those teams together come up with the solutions, not any one person. Um, there weren't very many women at all in the market when I first started. And, and I, I loved the uh, video earlier, the, the three, well, the two ladies and obviously three founders for I work. Because like, like DJ, sort of, well, although I was 28 years ago, not 30, um, you know, I, I was a very, very small number. And I, but there were some really inspirational women for me who I did just want to name check. Um, we all made partner at the same time. A lady called Rebecca Jarvis at Link Late is in the UK. A lady called Katrina Buckley at Allen and Overy in the UK. And a lady called Mel Richards, who was at KPMG, who'd come from that West um, into the accounting profession, into the restructuring world. And, um, and there were not very many more of us. And we, although we didn't form an organisation like I work, we spent a lot of time together helping um, other women come through our various organisations. And the two, those two ladies, Rebecca and um, Katrina, are now the global heads of their restructuring and insolvency um, teams globally, which is just great, I think, that even though there were very few of us back then, um, as individuals, we've progressed through our careers and are in the top jobs globally in, in our teams which I think is credit to sort of all of the support that men have given women as well. One of my main sponsors um, at PwC has been a guy called Ian Powell, who was our senior partner in the UK and led the EMEA um, cluster of PwC officers. But um, he was first and foremost a restructuring practitioner and led our restructuring services business for a long time. And without his support, I would, not, I would honestly um, not be where I am today. I also wouldn't be where I am today without a number of people who've really supported me in the team. I've got um, Izzy Gross and Catherine Atkinson with me who are senior women in our business in London. It's fantastic to have them here. And there are many, many, many great women um, in our organisation and broader that um, I would like to say that um, I've, I've tried to champion over, over the years. Um, my first huge case as a partner in the UK was, um, was Drax. And um, there was no other woman anywhere on that team, either in the advisors or in the professionals from the banks and the funds. Um, it was a very complicated structure, hundreds of stakeholders involved. Um, and um, it probably took me, I'm going to say, three to five years post that deal for people to really consider that there was a woman in the market that could do the sorts of things that men did. Um, and I remember when De Beers came in to me as a, as a, as a case uh, several years later, and it was fabulous to get involved in diamonds, right? Who doesn't want to be involved in diamonds? It was, it was amazing. Um, but I really felt that the market had kind of acknowledged that I could come out of the wings, from underneath the wings of the um, male leaders that I'd been working with until that point. And one, a couple of the bankers actually did go to my boss and say you know you can you can leave now <laughs> you, you we've, we've got some we've got we've got somebody in heaven that the market trusts and the teams that she brings together um so that was a sort of pivotal moment for me I think in my career that I realized that um I was trusted as an individual practitioner um alongside along with the teams that worked for me um we talked a, a lot about different sectors actually in that economics chat earlier I thought that was fascinating. And one of the brilliant things about restructuring and insolvency, I think, um, is that we are, we're not badged as one individual sector people. In a world which 
specialism and increasing amounts of specialism by sector is required. I think we're very, very lucky that we can spend a huge amount of time learning in almost every sector. And uh, you very kindly listed off a load of the sectors that I've been involved in. But um, you do get branded sometimes with these um, industries. And I know we talked about cyclical structural decline in sectors and whether we should bail out or not. Fascinating debate. Um, but I, I did get branded in the UK on a couple of occasions. So I pretty much did every um, health club to gym chain restructuring. And thankfully, I was looking slim and trendy in those days. And um, I, I was branded the fitness lady. But unfortunately, um, the next branding that I ended up with was the rubbish lady, because the next sector to go through huge amounts of um, structural decline in the UK was the uh, waste industry. And, uh, and I also managed to work with the teams at PwC on many, many of the waste businesses in the UK and broader, um, wide, wider globally that got into trouble. Um, and more recently, I think because of my involvement in, in Asia, uh, more recently, I've done a huge amount of project finance infrastructure work. Um, which has taken me to all parts of the world. And Africa is a, is a very interesting place to do business. Um, not at all, as, as you would imagine, a more de developed um, country. But it is really, really, really important that we do help um, those territories that don't have the same skills and expertise that we have here in the US or in the UK or in many of our other developed territories. Um, and it's very, very hard to restructure um, infrastructure businesses outside of um, the main advanced territories in the world. But it's critically important that we do. And also, we, we haven't really touched on ESG um, at all over the course of today. And quite often, we do forget about it in restructuring um, because it's, it costs money to do things that are, that are, are more um, ESG friendly. Perhaps we have talked about social side and gender equality, et cetera. But um, a lot of the other things that those corporates really need to embrace, um, we haven't necessarily talked on. So maybe that's a topic that you could pick up at another one of um, your events, because I think it is going to be critically important going forward um, for businesses that are going through restructuring. And it will cause restructurings of businesses to happen if, if people don't wake up and do the things that they really do need to do. And we are seeing that as a, as a trend in the, in the market. Um, not much more, thankfully, because I'm, 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 I don't know I'm between you and lunch. Um, but I, I have been inspired by um, many women over the years. I hope that um, I've been able to ins in, inspire many more women to join our profession and stay in our profession. I've certainly um, tried to recruit many women into, um, into our world. <laughs> And, um, and helped and supported them and, and, and hopefully enabled them to fly in a way that Mr. Powell enabled me to fly in my early career. I've always maintained that the technical side of what we do is something that we can learn. Yes, it's complicated, but we're all really bright, capable people. We wouldn't be in this industry if we weren't. And, um, and so, you know, I think that creating an environment for that innovation to come out and that analytical skill to be put together with um, solution making, I think is what diversity um, really helps with. And us being able to do that, and I work being able to bring diverse groups of people together to do that, I think is fantastic. Um, the hardest part though, I think of anything that any of us does, and we've talked about it a little bit today, is the whole stakeholder management piece. The increasing complexity that we see in our work globally the hundreds and thousands of not only institutions, but individuals who are involved in restructurings. It's like it was never before. Um, and the challenges that the world has today, I think we've been through an enormous period of relative stability, but the challenges that the world has today are so much more extreme, whether it's the political um, geopolitics between China and, and America and the impact on the rest of the world, all of the inflation difficulties, you know, it, we've we've heard a lot about them a lot about them today, but that stakeholder management piece, I think, actually, is where women can really come to the fore. I think I know I don't want to be too generic, but I think the natural skill sets of women in listening, in understanding, in asking questions, in caring, in nurturing, in 
bringing and collaborating together with groups of people. I have seen that happen on so many occasions in my restructuring life um, that people have broken through really difficult lock ahead moments to get hundreds of people through the eye of the needle. And I think that that's something that you as an organization, all of us as, as, a, as women in, in the industry should continue to help to nurture and really bring through in, in big, in you know restructuring situations we've got so many stakeholders that collaboration piece is really 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 important i think and i work plays a vital role in encouraging women uh, right around the world to continue to lead in that and, and do that and do that really really extremely well so thank you to all of you for everything that you've done for women in the industry thank you for um, recognizing me in this way um it's it is amazing i'm so so delighted and humbled um, that, that you've chosen me. Um, I'm delighted to be here in, in the US. I haven't been to the US since before COVID. Um, so it's, it was wonderful this morning at dawn to be out looking at your um, historic monuments and um, doing a bit of sightseeing with my, with my two UK friends. It, it was amazing. Um, but I also did want to, I didn't think I could actually leave the podium without saying a big thank you, although he's not here to my husband who without him I definitely couldn't have had the career